Welcome, I'm Evan Cooper, and in this session of Masterclass, we'll be discussing impact investing with Mary Jane McQuillan, Managing Director and Head of Environmental, Social, and Government Investment at ClearBridge Investments. What exactly is impact investing? In one sense, it's much like the more widely known socially responsible investing in that those in both camps want their money to do good in addition to earning a good return. But whereas socially responsible investors tend to define themselves by what they won't or don't invest in, such as companies involved in gambling or tobacco, for example, impact-oriented investors tend to focus on what they do want, which is a measurable, beneficial social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Of course, there are many ways one could pursue beneficial social and environmental goals through investing, and it's just those hows and whats of impact investing that we'll be discussing today. But first, let's look at a few of the whys. Mary Jane, start us off by discussing how impact investing evolved out of socially responsible investing. Sure, thanks. Um, many um, are familiar with the term socially responsible investing or SRI. Uh, today, that seems to be more of a historical term. You don't hear it as often as impact investing or environment social governance or ESG investing or sustainability investing. And I think part of the reason, and this is my own observation, has been the word responsible. And that's been tough for whether you're a fiduciary on a board for a very large foundation with large assets as a pension or a foundation, um, to, to use that word responsible. The idea of inserting values in your investment decision, the idea of putting your own personal views in your investment rigor, pro investment process and rigor. Um, what has happened more recently is the institutional community has been looking at socially responsible investing. Um, the terminology has shifted, and interestingly enough, the nomenclature can influence how investors perceive this term, and it's much more of an objective approach now. So uh, the idea of injecting um, environmental issues, social issues, governance issues is more about the analysis and risk control and management for the long term versus taking a specific value orientation and trying to insert that in the investment process. So like you said, with the invest impact investing, um, the, the current thinking today is it's not so much what to exclude or, or taking a stance on what's responsible and what's not responsible. It's more on how do you make an impact not just in terms of the planet, uh, people, workforce, and governance issues, but it's also about the impact to your investments themselves. Mm. And those of us who've been in this space for a while would argue that the impact in impact investing is also about long-term impact. And that's the key word is long-term, key term. David, what's your take? Well, I, I agree with that, and the only thing I would add is, in investments generally, we all know that there are many, many different kinds of asset classes and sub-asset classes. And in the same sense, there are different forms of impact investing. Sorry, just no. add to David's point, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes the perception is that impact investing is an asset class in and of itself. But within the realm of impact investing, um, there are different asset classes, and that's a distinction. So let, let me go, we'll just we will touch on SRI just for one second more. The responsible part seems to be subjective, but what about those the things like not investing in tobacco or firearms or something that somebody feels is sort of a, that they're using their value judgment to say that's not a good thing, I don't want to invest in it. Where, where does that fit in the world of impact investing now? Well, I think there are certain areas or certain industries um, that many of our clients, at least, have uh, as a group, seem to have com come to consensus that there are certain businesses that are not necessarily beneficial net-net to society, whether it's tobacco through health issues and concerns, whether through its weapons and the use of weapons in war and, and domestic use of weapons, frankly, um, or whether it's related to certain addictive areas. And, and I think the perception is that it's not necessarily helping society, um, it's it's an area that, from an investment perspective and, and building a portfolio, you don't necessarily have to be invested in those areas, and so um, there is this, uh, there is a certain sense of responsibility. But responsibility isn't a bad word. Ethics aren't a bad word. Um, implicit in everything that we do, we apply our values, whether we are conscious of it or not. Um, but there are certain areas that the impact to society overall, economically as well as health-wise and, and welfare that many would agree uh, we would want to avoid. So there is a little bit of subjectivity, but it's, it's usually, um, from our client base, a, a general consensus. One point I wanted to touch on, it seems, I mean, 
one could say in a kind of a critical way, that this is one of these granolish leftist kind of things, you know, uh, hold over from the 60s, you should do, do good, and uh, it's not really, it's sort of incongruous with serious investing, or even if not incongruous, it's kind of like a, an add-on that only rich liberals can afford to do. So, uh, but is this a serious form of investing? Similar to what David had said, we have very, uh, a large number of institutional clients who are very serious and um, maybe eat granola for breakfast, but they are very serious investors and they work with us because they're serious and they're thinking long term. Um, but many of them are high net worth and, and very successful at what they do, but they are thinking, you know, I've, I've worked very hard for whether it's my retirement plan or whether it's my, my constituents who I'm serving as a board member, this is something that I need to think about very seriously from a sustainability standpoint. So it's not do good or do bad, it's not who's right or who's wrong, it's very objectively how can we um, make sure that our investments, our investment process is as rigorous and as true to our mission as we can. So t how do you do it? How do you find investments that fit those criteria? Um, well, just to remind, I'm a, we're an active equity manager, and so our, our specialty is public equities. And if you think of the second largest asset class being public equities, there's a lot of room for influence in terms of impact investing. And so um, for us, we are very much a fundamental shop, so we have 20 plus analysts who are fundamental analysts who are looking at these companies from, you know, I hate to say it, quality of management, bottom up. Um, they're not only looking at the cash flow and growth earnings, but they're also looking at how long this um, management's team view is in terms of governance. How long are they are, are planning out five years, 10 years, 20 years? How are they taking these longer term considerations, these macro societal considerations into their business model, into their franchise? And so our analysts um, are tasked with not only coming up with great ideas for us to invest in, and they go through their sectors or they go through their portfolio specialties, but they're also asked to seriously consider and conduct the research around environmental and social governance issues. So as opposed to many of our analysts, you know, came from buy side or sell side shops, as opposed to saying just the investment in, in quotes, we're saying the investment in quotes and, and the investment in our idea, in our view, is, is taking every um, material and relevant piece of information, whether it's, it's from the financials or whether it's what's in the press or whether it's where the growth is coming from, all of that should be considered. And so the analysts um, provide a lot of the ideas in, in coming up with how to construct the portfolio. And would they say company X in a certain industry ranks highly on the impact scale and company Y rates poorly on this? On this so, scale? right, so there's an internal process where uh, when analysts is conducting a review for a certain industry or sector that the analysts will have, you know, the top pick um, from an investment standpoint and will also often be the top pick from an ESG standpoint or from um, impact investing standpoint. Uh, but they'll also say this n this name is actually really interesting. This is I could see a lot of growth coming into this um, uh, company, but I don't know if they're quite there in terms of s best sustainability practices. But let's go ahead and watch them and let's see if there's something that you know at the right time, the right valuation, we can participate in this position. I don't know whether this is a misperception or uh, to clarify it. Do investments that pass muster, whether equities or fixed incomes? for impact investing on that, that scale, do they do better, worse, the same as those that aren't, uh, that, that don't pass muster? Or how, how do they compare just in general to other investments? I, I think you have to say this, if regardless of which investment style or approach there is, that it really depends on the quality of the management team and the practitioners who are involved. So yes, there are cases uh, where firms or managers can outperform through this approach to investing, and there are also cases that other f managers have not performed as well, and it could be f for a variety of reasons, one including lack of experience. Uh, Clearbridge, as a firm, uh, goes back to 1964. Uh, we are ver have very deep bench in terms of our equity talent and our equity experience. So when we uh, were approached to amongst our investment team to begin or to incept um, an impact investing or sustainable investing approach back in 1987. We knew this is an area that we had a lot of experience in, and from 87 to even today, 2014, we still continue, consider ourselves continuing to improve, continuous improvement, which is what we always ask for our company to say as well. And, and I think that um, what happens is it, if, you know, oftentimes the SG investing or sustainable investing wants to be swept into a broad brush stroke. Do they perform or outperform? As we said, it really depends on the quality and care of the managers. For us, our experience has been, and again, this is because we have so many years working on these types of investments, which require you know, a, a, ver a fair amount of rigor and a fair amount of care. 
um, that we've performed as well. We've been very competitive um, in terms of risk adjusted returns over the 1, 3, 5, 7, and 10. There's a guarantee future, but our experience has shown that uh, we can perform as well, if not better. And the reason behind that is because we, I, I believe that ClearBridge has a quality bias. We've got the uh, years and years and years of experience. Um, I started working in this space 17 years ago or 18 years ago, and um, we've been very disciplined. And if you're going to go about constructing a process of how do you take in additional factors, you can't just you know, glom them on or add them on or consider it as a screen afterward. It has to be something that you, you integrate in the fundamental approach. And at the very beginning, if you're paying attention to these issues and you're finding ways of where they add value or where to avoid risk, and you're constructing a portfolio or a series of strategies, and you look at the uh, performance over time, and you look at the attribution and say, why did it outperform or why did it underperform? Oftentimes, you can find the reason goes back to the stock selection. And the stock selection is not very carefully um, conducted in the sense that we're looking for those quality names thinking long term. So um, oftentimes the companies that we're investing in, um, in, in terms of the stocks that wind up in the portfolio, are companies that have really been successful at what they do. You know, one could argue that th everything has an impact. You can have a negative impact, you can have an impact on people's lives, you bring you know, comfort and ease, you bring more products and services to their neighborhood or community. But there's also the impact where you're saying, are we continuously improving? Are th is, is our quality of life improving as investors, aside from the portfolio? And um, what we found is that companies want to continuously improve. And this is where, and this could be another discussion, and I'm sure David has comments on this, is, is the idea of engagement. So a manager, or this approach to investing for ESG, in my case, uh, would say, okay, today we construct a portfolio of all these ideas that we have, that our fundamental team has been doing this research, that um, we've been doing a lot of um, external research, internal research, we've come up with this portfolio, so now what do you do? For us, that's not enough. It's not day one and you're done. It's this continuous monitoring and engagement. So for all of our companies, and it takes a lot of work, we actually engage with every single company through our fundamental analysts to see what sort of sustainability strategy they have in place. That should be, a, in our view, that should be a basic question that every analyst um, or every investor thinks about. What is your sustainability strategy? Not just sustainability growth of earnings, but sustainability and how are you going to be here? Where are you going to extract those resources? How are you going to make sure that your franchise, your business model, still has a place to be in society in 20, 30 years? So an interesting segue, and I'll stop if, if that's okay. An interesting segue is related to millennials. And what we find is that the next generation is really thinking about the long term. And so where we've seen a lot of growth of interest is through the millennials, because they're the ones who actually are thinking, what am I going, what kind of world am I going to be living in 30 years from now? And they're very bright, and, and a lot of it, transparency is really important to them. I want to get to David's comments, yes, but I want, I want to ask you too, one thing, are all the fun, all the, um, products from, came, uh, from uh, ClearBridge, do they have a stamp that said this is uh, okay impact investing? Are there ones that are high on the impact scale and th those that aren't? Is it clearly delineated which are and which aren't? Well, our history goes back a while, so as I mentioned, um, where uh, we were public equity managers. And so when we go back to 1964, we didn't have the client demand, as David mentioned, um, specifically, explicitly asking for this. From 87 on, we have a pool of assets where we know that clients are asking for even more research, even more advocacy, even more engagement. And so for those strategies, we do name them, if that's what you're asking, we'll is label it's, them. It's, it's, it's labeled. It's, it's labeled, is, okay. you know. Um, we're labeling it more for the client because we're really not changing our process that much. It's really making sure that our clients um, are, are aware that we're doing this work for them on their behalf. It's their assets at the end of the day, and if this is important to them, then this is something that we should, we should do um, correctly. Yeah. And let's talk about the clients for a moment. Who, who are they? Are they institutions? <coughs> what kinds of institutions? Retail? Who, who are the clients for these things? Um, uh, I think we probably have maybe to even ask to allocate the equity doesn't fix them to you. But uh, the, their pensions, their foundations, their endowments, their um, high net worth individuals, their family foundations. But any kind, of, what what distinguishes the ones who care about this? Anything in particular? I mean, among among your clients, it's for certain kinds of family offices or certain kinds of institutions. I, it, you know, it's it's funny. You would think that they would be. You can put them in a box or put a label on them, they're actually pretty diverse. I mean, they're, they're, you know, in the old days, you might say that you're a left wing or that you're a tree hugger or you're granola. That's the old days. Today, um, our clients really, 
you know, cover the full bandwidth. And they all, whether they realize it or not, they all care about a very similar things. Energy efficiency, they want to make sure they have secure energy going forward. They want to make sure that um, materials and waste usage is reduced. They want to make sure that people are treated properly. They want to make sure that the companies that they're investing, they can trust the management, that they're not being overpaid. Those like simple little indicators, they're simple, but they're not that simple. Um, are, are fairly common across our Republican, Democrat, our North or South, or South, or individual institutional clients. Their, their investment and values, and they might put values in parentheses, um, approach and, and view on, on their investments is, is very similar, but they just don't quite know that they're, they're um, articulating that to us. But it would seem to that that's more of, uh, in, in a sense, maybe the, art, the origination of this is more institutional, and in that in, institutions tend to approach things this way with a board and the kind of the objectives and looking at it more logically and and, and or maybe family. Now, now, which planet have you been working on? <laughs> that's <laughs> 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 we brainwash <laughs> <think> the <that> institutions <laughs> do that. Um, but is, is that the case? That that it's that it, is that more family offices, I would say, where it's a reflection of a certain value, approaching it from that kind of way of looking at things. I don't know whether individual investors approach it that way traditionally, or am I wrong? Which well, happens a lot. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, um, it, it's an interesting world we live in today in, in terms of interesting times. The, I think the culture has opened up. I think people's awareness has increased. As David had said, the levels of transparency are much higher. And so, um, interestingly enough, uh, if you were thinking about the clients, who are the clients and where are they coming from and are they vocalizing what they're interested in in terms of their investments? But on the other end, increasingly we're seeing um, many of the major broker dealers, uh, the wirehouses like the Morgan Stanleys and the UBSs and the Merrill Lynch's. And Morgan Stanley recently launched, I think two years ago, their Investing with Impact platform, which was a platform specifically to highlight investing with impact products. And they call it Investing with Impact because it's more of a verb in action. And, and that was kind of the big hurdle because you, you would have clients who were interested, but they either didn't know that this was an investment option out there that's available. They didn't have any advisors to ask, you know, how to, can you, I vet this, who runs the due diligence and who tracks the performance and the managers. And they didn't know what um, access or platforms. They didn't have, it, like if they went to the Morgan Stanley broker years ago, they might have had a hard time finding the products, uh, the Morgan Stanley advisor is. And so I think this increased awareness on the front end or the, the the beginning of the supply chain, meaning the client, transpiring over and translating it into um, activities and product selection by the advisors, translating over into the institutional world, meaning the wirehouse and the, the platform, to the um, uh, asset owners in the pensions and the foundations. Um, I think that what has happened over time is that there's this been this openness and this acceptance that you know maybe this does make sense. You know, intuitively, we all know it makes sense. It's it's such a simple story, but yet it's so hard to get through. And it, you wonder how you know when people say, "Well, the assets and how the assets growing." It, they're growing, but they're. Um, I think it, 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 this is a, a time where we find, and I I've, I don't know if David has a different opinion, but it, it seems like this is a time when all a lot of the forces are coming together. The access through the platforms, the recommendations with the consultants, and the um, articulation by the clients or the asset owners. And how do we compare to other countries? How Europe, Asia, <coughs> how do they view this? Uh, I, the, what's interesting, I think, is when they first started counting the assets in the United States, the trade group, the U.S. Uh, CIF, uh, uh, social. Sustainable. USF. Sorry, the, the name's really long. But it's Mary USF. Jane and I were both on that board. <laughs> <And> they've, <laughs> they've changed the name since we left the board. So so. What, what is it? It's, it's like a, the trade organization, nonprofit for social investment or ESG investment or impact investment professionals in the United States. Right, okay. And there are different <laughs> chapters throughout the world. So there's US SIF, there's UK SIF, Euro SIF, Japan SIF, SIF, Latin American SIF, so on and so forth. And each of the SIFs are these member organizations, which we're both members of for the US, where they want to see how, what the trends are. So they have this trends report they publish every two years. And when the U.S. first started counting, we were the largest and we were probably the oldest in terms of this approach. And then Europe um, it quickly caught up. And I think the reason why the, this is my own speculation, the reason why the assets in Europe grew, uh, eventually grew so quickly in a very short period of time is because of the institutional acceptance. And the way, from what I could see with a lot of the discussions amongst our investment professional peers, 
um, many of our, um, whether it's the sell side or the buy side in, in Europe and, and also in Asia, is that their discussion about ESG or SRI is not that it's a feel good or moralistic. They, they talk about it as an investment approach for um, managing risk, for looking for good opportunities, for looking for high quality companies. And that's been the framework of discussion um, in many of the mainstream firms in Europe. So it wasn't too much of a leap of faith to think about sustainable investing. In the US, it had been almost polarized as an individual approach that is very subjective that, you know, how extreme do you go? Do you, do you, you know, exclude paper companies because of tobacco? And, and that caused a lot of advisors to have a certain amount of consternation of how do we put our arms around this? How do we describe this in a sound bite? And it was hard for them to do, many of them. And so I think that led to the discomfort in understanding it and communicating it to their clients or finding products and, and being able to track it. But that has, a lot of this has changed, and two big events have changed. One is we are now at a point in history where we know so much about what's going on in the climate and the carbon count and what's going on in terms of um, natural disasters and the environment and the economic effects. But we also have a lot of intellectual rigor around the analysis of, of is this approach making sense or not? So the number of studies that are out there are, are very, are very high number, I want to say hundreds. Um, they're coming out of the universities of you know the MITs and the Harvards and the and the Whartons, but they're also coming out of the consultants, the Mercers, the Callens, and so on. And they're also coming out of the CFA Institute. And the CFA Institute recently did a survey where they found that um, the majority of advisors and consultants were not aware of uh, impact investing or did not know how to explain it. So we will often say in our community where we're talking about this approach is that um, there's a huge learning curve, but then there's a huge amount of potential because here is a large group of advisors who didn't know. And now that they're going to be in the know eventually, um, will that change their behavior? And so the CFA Institute, I think in anticipation, created a manual for analysts and for advisors. And, and I think if it, most every group, whether it's the UN or whether it's law firms from the fiduciary standpoint, you can find pieces of research that are helping the institutional as well as the individual. And so the world is changing in terms of the information. Because it seems, unless, uh, again, uh, you know, like in, in <coughs> restaurants now you have a menu that's, you know, gluten-free, uh, vegan. Right. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's on Morningstar where you just tick off, uh, is it? it oh, is? yeah, it, it is? Morningstar does track socially responsible funds. So it and you can search for that. It'll say impact, is there a little decal? I do they use response? I think they use responsible. Responsible. I'm not yeah, positive. Morningstar, I guess, for the funds, and, yeah. and we manage separate accounts, so the, the likes of Immerser and uh, um, uh, Cambridge Associates would track a lot of our separate account strategies, and they have units, so our groups called, you know, responsible investing or mission-related investing, and they create these databases where they rank, rank or rate the managers based on their ESG capabilities. So again, in some ways, this has been a, this is an old story. This is you know this idea of socially responsible investing transforming itself into this approach right. called impact investing, which is a broader umbrella covering private equity and community investing and equity, uh, public equity and, list and others, and and so you're going through that transformation to a certain extent, where. Um, now, you know, from, from our experience, the consultants have really been t kind of picking this up, not just as a point of distinction. So if you're going to choose advisor A or advisor B, and this is an area that you're thinking about, you might choose advisor B if advisor B is more informed and has more access to products on the platform. So um, if there is a lack of products on the platform, from what we've been hearing, the advisors just need to communicate that to a certain extent because corporate is not necessarily going to put every product on the platform. You have to have that you know, request from the l largest producers, which also comes from the clients. So um, we're seeing a lot of changes in there. So and, and it's worth mentioning that Steve and his colleagues at First Affirmative have been doing this work for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Let's say an advisor is watching this and thinks, ooh, this is a good idea. It resonates with me, and I think it'll resonate with some of my clients. Where would they go for more information? What could they do to find out more and become more knowledgeable about this? Go to Clearbridge, obviously. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, you, you could look <coughs> at the, the different membership groups. So US CIF is one um, where they, they list the members and their different products. Uh, you can go to the individual websites of the companies themselves. Um, there are a number of studies that 
are out there to try to debunk or, or um, corroborate the idea of the performance question. And many of those studies will cite certain firms as case studies. So you can find the firm. So when, when we're approached by clients or consultants, it's often because we popped up in various types of searches, whether it's through the database, because our marketing team would put all of our information in the database, or, um, or through the research studies or through the membership groups. Yeah, we're, we're mm -hmm. hiding in plain sight. So <laughs> I mean, folks want to find us, they're, they're, we're all we're all So just findable. Google impact investing yes. and up you pop. Let's hope, let's hope so. Yes. So. <laughs> um, well, that, that, that's good, good to find out. But I think uh, the um, w w one other question I wanted to ask about about that and, and how I advisors can um, sort of how can, how should they talk to their clients about this if, if to find out whether client if the clients aren't aware but they think they may be what what's a good way to bring this up? Well, I was going to say oddly enough, one uh, one of the first steps is that the advisor actually listens to the client. Like in the old days, we've had clients come to us that the advisor wouldn't listen to me, and and so. If you got past that point, now the advisor is listening to you once you word, use the word environment or society or, or long term. And then now advisors, uh, I, you know, I, to give a lot of credit to many of the advisors, I think they're just starting to know what's going on in the marketplace. And what's going on in the marketplace is people are asking more questions. And as more data is out there through the databases and through the consultancies and through the rating agencies, you're seeing uh, more evidence. And so the evidence is showing that there are more products available and they've gone through the same rigor. So this is one point I think many of us in this space would very much um, affirm that as a consultant and advisor, don't give us any breaks. Look at us through all of your risk metrics, what are the risk characteristics, look at our performance, look at the quality of the team, look at our experience, um, look at our fees, look at you know our performance against the benchmark, against our peers. All that should take place as it normally would. And um, as more advisors have done this, as a result of more platforms starting to open up, and make the products available, a lot of the advisors are saying, you know, I don't even have to do the due diligence on this. The platform is, the, the research department within the platform has done this. And, and so that's really helped in terms of time management. So they don't have to go out there and try to figure it out. It's there, it's on the menus. As, as we're approaching the, uh, the top of the hour here, let's um, go over some takeaways or your takeaway. Of what, it is, and this is mainly geared to advisors, what should they know about impact investing that will help them do their jobs better. So Mary Jane, we'll start with you. I would just say that um, it's it's not so different than what they might think it is. Uh, it is different than what they might think it is if it's, if it's the old perception. But um, that it, it is a viable long-term investment option that it can provide um, pretty strong depending on the manager, com risk adjusted competitive returns, that the fees are not, uh, uh, are, tend to be very competitive, that the um, diversity of assets across, uh, of products across asset classes has increased, and that uh, if they were to bring it up to their client, most clients today uh, would at least think about it, you know, and they plant the seed yeah. and they think about it. Um, they, you know, but what would really be helpful is if the advisor understood what the process was or what it isn't, and, and then communicated that to the client, because then they're working together as opposed to one going this way and one going this way. Mary Jane, David, Steve, thank you for your insights and into impact investing. I'm sure that for advisors and their clients who want to do well and do good through their investments, this has been very informative. For SETV, this is Evan Cooper. Mm -hmm.